Well, the 1997 movie Titanic was one of the biggest blockbusters of all time. Uh, the film earned more than $2 billion with a B. It won 11 Academy Awards, including Best Picture. Uh, in fact, famed film critic Roger Ebert wrote that Titanic was flawlessly crafted, intelligently constructed, strongly acted, and spellbinding. Now, despite its success and popularity, I've only seen the movie twice. I watched it when it first came out in the theaters with my wife, and then I watched it uh, not long afterwards on cable television. Did you catch that? It was so long ago, I watched it on cable TV. Like, I don't even know if people still have cable TV. And I just have no interest in seeing the movie again. And I also would not tell you that it's a good movie. And here's the reason why. I hated the ending. I thought it was brutal. Now, now you might go, did you not know the ship was going to sink? Like, that should have been obvious. Okay, well, I understand the quick rush to judgment, but let me assure you that the ship running into the iceberg was not my issue with the movie. Like, I saw that coming a mile away. But my issue with the movie is that how Leonardo DiCaprio's character, Jack Dawson, met his demise. Now, I hope you're okay with me talking about the ending of a movie that's 20 plus years old, because that's what I'm gonna do. Maybe you know the scene. The Titanic sinks, and Rose, who's played by a 22-year-old Kate Winslet, she's laying on this wooden door from the Titanic wreckage, and she's floating in the ocean. And there at the end, you see Jack, who she fell in love with during the events of the movie, and he's in the water, and he's holding himself up on the edge of the floating door. And eventually, the freezing water is too much for him, and he either falls unconscious or dies, and Rose holds his frozen, hand, frozen hands and says, I'll never let you go. And then she lets him go. No, I'm serious. Like, that's what happens. And I, I, when I saw that, I reacted the same way I do when, like, I'm out with my wife, and I say, do you want dessert? And she's like, no, I'm good. And then I order mine, and then she starts eating it. Right? I'm kind of like, really? Like, really? Like, I'll never let you go, Jack. You know, <laughs> see ya. Like, what is that? It seemed to be room on that piece of wood for Jack, but they didn't even try. She just laid there freezing while he was dying. Now, maybe Jack would have been too heavy for the wood to stay afloat. We'll never know. I wish they just showed them trying. Like, I know he's going to die. The movie's about death, but... Whatever they did, I wish they had done it in a way that didn't leave us wondering. But, but I'm fairly certain that James Cameron, who wrote and directed the movie, is never going to know how I feel about his ending. And he's probably not going to care either. The guy's a great storyteller. He's the author of movies like The Terminator, True Lies, Avatar, maybe you've heard of it. Like, this guy is an incredible storyteller, and he doesn't need my approval. And I love talking about stories, and I think we all do, but the thing I don't like about other people's stories is we are stuck with their endings. Like, I can watch Titanic as many times as I want, which is zero, and his ending is always going to stick. It's his story. He's telling it. We cannot change the ending of stories that don't belong to us. But often, if we were honest, if we could change the outcome of a story, we would. But that's not the way life works. Or is it? Like, when the story's yours, can't you do whatever you want with it? And so, right now, each one of us is writing our family's story. Every day we're making choices that move us towards the next chapter. And maybe your story is a great story, and it's similar to all the generations before you. Maybe your story has changed from the one you were born with. And everyone has a story to tell. Mine began in Chicago, and today, as a Pastor Gary mentioned, I have three daughters, you know, 2017 and 14. This is my family, and we live in Cedar Falls, Iowa, and I get to help kids and students at our Prairie Lakes campuses across Iowa. But I came to know Jesus as a 16-year-old high school student, and to this day, I'm the only Jesus follower in my immediate family. And I remember less than a year after I had placed my faith in Christ, we celebrated Thanksgiving, the first, my first one as a believer. And it was just my mom and my dad and my brothers, two brothers, and so my brothers and I got up in the morning, they came into my room, and we started playing video games together. Uh, it was Nintendo, the original one, that's how long ago this was. And we just kind of hung out, because in my house, we always had to have dinner done, Thanksgiving dinner, by 3 o'clock. Because at 3 o'clock is when the Dallas Cowboys play. Now, before you come up to me and be like, Cowboys, or I hate the Cowboys, I couldn't care less about the NFL, but my brother and my, I'm a baseball guy, but my brothers and my dad were diehard. Like, if it was 2.59 and we weren't done eating, they peaced out. They were like, we're done. 
So my mom learned, hey, if we eat at two, we'll be good. So eventually it became that time. My brothers and I went and sat at the table, and it was in the dining room. Like, I don't know if you have a dining room, but we did growing up, and it's that room you can go in like three times a year, right? So everything looks so nice, and using the china that for some reason you keep in a cabinet forever and never use it. And we sat down, and it was like, wow, this all looks so great, except we didn't look so great. We had never gotten dressed. We were still wearing our pajamas. My mom did not appreciate this at all. And let's just say my older brother was 18, my younger brother was 11, so there was a lot of emotions, a lot of arguments, and dad got involved, mom was upset, there were tears, and eventually everybody had to go to their rooms. And I want to mention that we had not started eating yet, which made it very much worse. And I was in my room, and I remember laying on the floor crying. And then I was hit with this realization. As a new Jesus follower, I had access to God, like I could talk to him. And this was this new development in my life, so I wasn't exactly sure how to do this, so I just said, God, would you change the course of this day? Would you bring us back together? Would you somehow just make good of this? Because this is terrible. And I should add that this is a home where conflict was not swept under the rug. It was drawn out and verbally processed for a long time. That is something my wife has really grown to appreciate over the years. That's sarcasm. You'll pick up on it eventually. But what was amazing is I got dressed and came downstairs and my brothers did the same. And we ended up eating together and then we watched the Cowboys destroy the New York Giants. And so that night ended and I was alone in my room and I was just thinking about this and going, I just unlocked something really big in my life. Like my story is still being written. God has intervened in my life and he was changing my family's story. Like I had this incredible life hack that my story didn't have to be filled with the selfishness, anger, and unhappy endings, but this new thing was God was going to be a game changer. And so even as a teenager, 16 years old, I started to think about that one day I'll have a family and that God was going to do something new in that family if I would just turn my heart toward him. And some of you are going to say, well, I have a great story unfolding. But for many of us, much like the movies and television, our stories don't play out always the way we had thought they would or hoped. And maybe your story is marked with divorce, tragedy, regret, confusion. Or you just found yourself wanting things to be different, but you just don't know what to do and you've lost hope or stopped trying. And you think it's a lot like Titanic where you're just stuck with the ending that's already been determined. But hear this. No matter where you find yourself today, God can change the course of your family. Your story is not done being written. So if you have a copy of God's Word, find Deuteronomy chapter 30, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. If you uh, have your phone, you can use the YouVersion Bible app, right? And the reason it's so important to get a copy of God Word, God's Word in front of your hand when you can, because then you can mark it up, you can remember stuff, and you can make sure that I'm not just making up what I'm saying. So before we look at these verses, I want to set up what's happening. So Moses is talking to the people of Israel. Now, you might know Moses from the 1998 DreamWorks picture, Prince of Egypt, but he's also a really big deal in the Bible. Now, he was abandoned as a baby. He was raised by Egyptians, even though he was Jewish, and eventually, God called him to rescue the Israelites from being slaves to the Egyptians. And so in Deuteronomy, Moses is rehashing this covenant. That means agreement, that God had made this agreement with the Israelites. And they kept breaking it. And so Moses thinks, well, maybe it's fresher in their mind, they'll stop breaking it. And time out, I just want to say that this is why we need to read God's word, because we forget the truths that God has given us. The reason I mentioned the version earlier is maybe if you're struggling to get in that habit, the version has these great reading plans. You can even share them with people and do it together, but they are such great ways to make sure that you get in God's word every day. And so what was happening here in Deuteronomy is that the people of Israel had adopted the self-first mindset, and they thought, it doesn't matter how I live. I can just go with the flow and eventually, you know, blessing is still going to come. But the Old Testament just hammers the tragic cost of living an unrepentant life, which means a life where we choose our way over God's. So their story was just not heading in a great direction. And not just individually, but their families, their nation. Like they were in this together. And so Moses is going to tell them how to change their story. And if you have notes, this is where it starts. And the first one is to accept what you cannot change. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 1. When all these blessings and curses I have set before you come on you and you take them to heart, wherever the Lord your God disperses you among the nations. All right, Moses is saying, um, he's explained some things that are going wrong because of their disobedience. 
but God still promised blessing. So he's like, hey, look, you've been obedient, or you've been disobedient, and there's going to be some hard times, and there's going to be some blessings. Both blessings and curses, they're coming, and you can't change that. And then he says, look in the verse there, he says, so take these things to heart, which means accept them for what they are. And in the same way that the blessings and curses were coming to Israel, when we accept the hard things as part of our stories, we have the freedom to move forward. And here's two of the things we can't change. And the first one is you can't change your family. Uh, Hold on, man. Isn't this a sermon about changing your family? No, it's about changing your family's story. Because you can't change the characters in your family, no matter how much you want to at times. And you also can't force change in their lives. Because God has purposefully built your family, and it makes you who you are. But you just can't force change in the lives of others. The answer to your family's story isn't that your parents or your sister or your kids would be different because that is out of your hands. Like, as a parent, one of the most freeing things I find is knowing I can't change my kids. I can influence them, but God needs to change them. So you can't change your family, and the second is you can't change the past. What's done is done. Like, there is no mad scientist coming to invent a time machine out of a DeLorean and fix things. Okay, that was a Back to the Future reference. Can you nod if you got it? All right, we got some of you. That's good. We not only can't change the past, but we just can't ignore it. Because sometimes to accept what we cannot change, we got to go back to move forward. Because if we're honest, many of us would admit that we've done things that have set our stories in the wrong direction. Like we've sowed some wild oats and then hoped for a crop failure. Like I am no farmer, but I'm pretty sure if you plant corn... And then you really, 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 really hope it turns into soybeans, it's still going to be corn. And in the same way, if we sow disobedience, we are going to reap things that we don't want. And maybe you're like, well, I I want a deeper relationship with God, but, but you haven't taken next steps, and spiritual rhythms are not a priority, so you haven't moved forward with God. Maybe you've made excuses for why you don't serve or have a regular kingdom responsibility, and you say, why am I not experiencing more from God? Maybe you're a parent and you say, why don't my kids love Jesus more? But, but you haven't prioritized influencing them spiritually at home or maybe haven't got them connected in church. And just so you know, in church, they're going to have about 40 hours a year with your kid. Parents, you're going to have about 3,000. You tell me who's going to be a greater influence in their lives. One of the first things I tend to ask families when they're saying, talking about a family problem is, hey, have you prayed about that? And most of the time they say, honestly, I'm like, no, not really, or not as much as I should. And not as much as I should as Christians speak for, no. Tell me I'm wrong, come on. But the thing is, what's done is done. You can't change the past. And so if we're going to change our family story, this is where it starts. Embracing the idea that we can't change what's done or what we haven't done. We can't change what's been done to us. We, we also sometimes can't ignore it because... Maybe you've suffered some unspeakable tragedy. I'm so sorry that that happened, but that that is part of your story. Maybe you've been impacted by the choices of others. Or maybe it's your own choices that have caused you pain. Sitting in regret is useless. Regret is a useless emotion because we won't move forward. And there are times when you just need to get over it and move on. But other times we got to take time to understand the things in our past, name them, invite God to rewrite our stories with him. So over time, we can move past them. So accept what you cannot change. And second, align yourself with God. (laughs) You're like, hold up there, cowboy. Are you trying to say God and I aren't good? Well, no. But are you aligned with God where your family is concerned? Because back to the text, Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 2, when blessings and curses come, and when you and your children return to the Lord your God and obey him with all your heart, and with all your soul according to everything I command you today. And so two ways from this verse we can align ourselves with God, and the first one you'll see in there is return to the Lord, so turn to him. When you and your children return to the Lord, like underline that, because you can't change others, but if you admit right now that you want your family story to be different, then your action step is turning to God where your family's concerned. And the biblical word there is repent, and that's something we mess up a lot. It literally means to change of mind, change your mind, or reconsider your strategy for living. And it's like you're walking along, doing life, like all I do is win, win, and then boom, God gets your attention. And we have these moments, these crisis moments where we're like, oh, I really want things to be different. Yes, yes, thank you, Jesus. And then we keep going in the same direction. 
But repent means we get to that moment and then we go in a different direction. That is repentance. And so when we turn to God, we say, God, I'm not going to go in the same direction. And we start with the thing we can influence the most, which is yourself. Like maybe you know you need to personally get going with God. Well, maybe it's time to join a small group or develop some spiritual rhythms or ask someone to hold you accountable. Maybe you say, we're going to start praying as a family. I worked uh, with students for more than 20 years, and it just, one of the questions I'd ask, hey, tell me about like, how your parents interact with you in prayer and so forth, and I would say 80% of them have never prayed with their parents. And maybe it's time to do that. Maybe you pray as a couple if you don't have kids, or if you're younger, maybe it's time for you to be bold and ask your parents at times, hey, I got this going on. Can you guys pray for me? And if they're like, yeah, we'll pray for you, be like, no, I mean now. Like, let's actually pray right now, right? Or how about this? You tell your parents when they're stressed out, hey, can I just pray for you real quick? Uh, I don't know, I'd be scared. Yeah, but the Bible says in 1 Timothy 4.12, let no one look down on you because you're young, but set an example for believers in speech, faith, life, life, love, and purity. Like God's not like, well, when you grow up, you can kind of be bolder. God's like, no, right now. And so here's the point. Like we need to go in a different direction. And I think about this week, my family and I really got off track. Like there was so much selfishness and everyone's fighting for their own rights. And so got everybody together in the kitchen and Lest you think that they were all like, yes, dad, let's all pray together. They were very reluctant, annoyed. We talked about what was happening. We named it. We called it out. And we prayed together. And then we held hands and sang a hymn. No, not at all. Afterwards, I believe they looked at me and go, are we done? <laughs> yes, we're done. You guys can go. But, but here's the thing. We noticed a small shift. And it was really amazing. I've got a 17-year-old who decides to take, you know, like 90-minute showers right before her sisters want to go to bed. And that night she said, hey, I'm going to take a shower in a few minutes if everyone needs to use the bathroom. I was like, what just happened? Right? And the thing is, we need God. We need him to turn to him and say, God, I can't fix this. So when it comes to our family, turn to him. Back to the text, verse 2, chapter 30. And when you and your children return to the Lord your God and, you should underline this, obey him with all your heart, with all your soul, according to everything I've commanded you. So when we turn to him, it, may, it includes making sure we obey him. Because literally the first thing every Jesus follower should do when they're not getting the results of their life that they think or hope they should be getting is saying, God, show me where I'm not being obedient. Because one of the major themes in the Bible is that obedience brings blessing and disobedience brings judgment. And where our families are concerned, God, where uh, am I honoring my parents? And fun fact, honor your parents in the Bible has no age limitation. So if your parents are still alive, God still calls you to honor them. How about asking ourselves, like, are we um, loving our husbands or wives as Christ loved the church? Are we living with them in an understanding way? Oh, that one's hard. I struggle with that one, right? I don't know if you've ever seen the book, like, it's called Understanding Women, and you open it up and it's blank. Just saying, but are you working to understand the person you're doing life with? Are we conducting ourselves as God has called us, loving and serving each other? Because if we're going to change our family's stories, we just have to align ourselves with God, and that means we turn to him with this heart that's ready for obedience. And we, God, would you guide me towards obedience where you've called me in our families, in my family? And maybe you're wondering, well, if I can't change others, how do I help the other people in my family turn to God? Well, it always starts with you first, but then, depending on your family situation, you activate a plan for others. And this is going to look different if you're single, if you're a teenager, if your kids are in the home, or if they've moved on, but either way... The third thing is to activate a plan for your family. Because sometimes we love to pray and then we do nothing. So take action. Like get up and fight. I'm going to recommend a book to you. It's by a guy who writes leadership books called Patrick Lencioni. And it's called The Three Big Questions for a Frantic Family. And in this book, he starts out with the idea that if they ran their business the way they ran their family, that they would be out of business. And so he tells this story with some practical ways to change the tide. And one of his suggestions that I love so much is that every family should have a rallying cry every few months. It's like, what's the one thing as a family that if we don't do it, we're not going to move forward? It's going to, we got to name it, we got to share it with our family, and then have a plan to put it in practice. Like the first one we did after I read this book, we made the rallying cry, establish regular rhythms for family relationships. But why? Because we just weren't connecting enough. Everybody's doing their own thing, and the urgent was crowding out the important. And as every parent knows, my kids were growing up way too fast. 
and I just want my family story to be different. I don't want to be my, my, my story be, well, dad was always working. Dad was never around. And so we did two things. One, we started eating dinner together. And that's just something that we weren't doing. It was like, well, you're coming home then, I'm coming home then, dinner's ready, eat when you want. And I would say since, that, since we did that, and it's been a while, at least four times a week we eat dinner together, and it changes so much. The girls even put their phones away. It's amazing. And the other thing is I have appointments with my girls every week. They don't always know when I'm setting them because some of them, sometimes they're like, if I tell them, they're like, I'm really busy. But other times if I'm like, hey, let's go do this, they say yes. But it's on my to-do list, it's on my calendar, and I know, hey, on Tuesday, I'm going to find time with Megan. And on Thursday, Eric and I are going to go do this. Because if it's not on my calendar, it's really not that important, right? For you, this is going to look different depending on your situation. But, but guys, too often we pray for something and then we hope for something. And hope is just not a strategy. We just go back to our normal routines and we think things are magically going to be better. So we got to take action align ourselves with God and activate a plan and last, anticipate God working. When you accept what you cannot change and you align yourself with God and you activate a plan for your family, that's going to further that alignment. The Bible says in verse 3 that there are some things that we can be confident God's going to do. And these are things that we can anticipate to believe that the God who is always at work is going to do these things. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, we're going to start in verse 3. Then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have compassion on you, and gather you again from all the nations where he scattered you. Even if you have been banished to the most distant land under the heavens, from there the Lord your God will gather you and bring you back. And I love that, banished to the most distant lands, because sometimes we feel we're so far gone. And I just wrote down that restoration is coming. The Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have compassion on you. Loved ones, we can, be count, we can count on that. God wants to restore us. The second one is from verse 5. Blessing is coming. Verse 5, he will bring you to the land that belonged to your ancestors and you will take possession of it and he will make you more prosperous and numerous than your ancestors. And you know, sometimes we just start thinking like, wow, there's so much pressure. Like my parents, you know, they were fine or maybe they weren't fine, but, but I want to do way better. And it's really just about moving the needle some. And not long ago, my 17-year-old told me that, uh, she goes, dad, I'm going to parent so much differently and so much better than you. And I said, good, I hope so because I think I'm doing a little better than my mom and dad. You know, they didn't follow Jesus, and I'm doing that, and I hope my kids do better, and I hope my grandkids do even better, and I hope it's many, many generations. They look, and they recognize that this generation was the transitional one. It was the one that started it, but then it just keeps turning a little bit. God wants to bless you. Blessing is coming. In verse 6, transformation is coming. The Lord your God will circumcise your hearts and the hearts of your descendants so that you may love him with all your heart and with all your soul and live. Here, here's what God wants to do in your life. Isaiah 43, 19. God says, see, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. And I love this part. Do you not perceive it? Don't you see it? I'm making a way in the wilderness. Doesn't our family seem like a wilderness sometimes? And I'm making streams in the wasteland. You see, God wants to do something new in your family. Like, do you get that? He's going to make a way, so anticipate it. Just like, you know, here in Iowa, we anticipate summer coming. And now like this week, we're anticipating like a little less summer, right? And then we're going to anticipate the fall, and it's so beautiful. And then we're going to anticipate Christmas. Then we're going to anticipate winter being over. And we'll wait a long time, and it'll eventually happen. And in the same way that we're like so eager for that stuff, anticipate God working. Because God is always, 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 always at work. Hey, quick question. How often is God at work? always, always. It means there's never a time when he's not doing something. And maybe you feel like it's too late, it's too hard, and there's just no way the curse of my family is going to be broken. And you look at it, if you were honest, you'd say, I'm doing the same things that my parents did that I said I would never do, and I don't know how I got here. If your family story has gotten off track, know that with Jesus, failure isn't fatal. I love what we were saying earlier, failure's never final when the father's in the room. Now, at, at the risk of coming off strange, I, I have a podcast. I'm not trying to sell that, but let me just say, we have an episode called, and it's called The Farther Along, the podcast. It's about moving forward and being intentional. And we have an episode called Coming Back from Failure. It is four times more popular than any episode. And you know why? Because all of us at times feel like when we fail, we have a, we are a failure. And I had this conversation with this pastor from California who has this incredible story of redemption, and I share that with you just because to think that failure 
makes us down and out is a lie straight from the enemy. Because that's what he wants you to think. He wants you to think when you're down, you're out. But you know who else felt that way? Like Joseph in the Bible. The dude was literally in a pit, and then his brothers sold him into slavery. You, you thought your family was dysfunctional. Moses, Moses killed a man, and he was found out and had to go into hiding. Rahab didn't make a great career choice and thought, God will never be for me. Peter, Peter denied knowing Jesus. And then Peter denied knowing Jesus. And then he went for the trifecta, and he denied knowing Jesus again. And how about Jesus? Like, Jesus knew down didn't mean out, but everyone else thought he was out when he was dead, died on that cross, was wrapped and put up in a tomb. And you're not alone at all. And maybe right now you need to hear that truth that down doesn't mean you're out. One of my favorite illustrations is from Dr. Tony Evans. He's a pastor in the Dallas area. And I used to listen to Dr. Evans on the radio. And for those of you in Generation Z, the radio is a little box in your car. It's like Spotify without the choices, right? And he tells this great story from Rocky V. Now, Rocky V, Rocky Balboa was the heavyweight champion in the world, and he was retired. And in his retirement, he starts training a young boxer with the greatest boxing name ever, Tommy Gunn. And so he's training Tommy, and Tommy eventually feels really confident, arrogant, and he's like, I want to fight for the championship. I want to fight for the title. And Rocky's like, you're not ready. You're not ready. And eventually, Tommy leaves him. And he goes to another promoter, and he gives him the title shot, and Tommy fights it, and, and he wins. So he's at the press conference after the fight, and thinking he's all that, and no respect at all. They're like, yeah, the guy you fought was a bum. You'll always be in Rocky's shadow. Well, Rocky had watched the fight and cheered Tommy on from home, and then he went to a tavern with his brother-in-law, Paulie. And he's just kind of hanging out when who comes in but Tommy Gunn with his manager. And right away, he's like, I challenge you to a fight, you and me in the ring. And Rocky's like, no, like, Tommy, I loved you. I don't want to fight you. And Tommy's not taking no for an answer. And then Paulie, now Paulie is not what you would call an athlete, and he gets up in front of this, you know, the heavyweight champion of the world's face, in Tommy's face, and Tommy knocks him down. And Rocky looks up, he goes, hey, Tommy, that's my Rocky voice, by the way. He's like, you knock him down, why don't you try knocking me down, right? And the manager gets in the way, no, 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 Tommy only fights in the ring. And Rocky's like, my ring's outside, right? So they go outside, and Rocky hits him a few times, but Tommy is younger, he is stronger, he is faster. And he knocks Rocky down, and there's Rocky Balboa laying in the gutter, and it's over. And then Rocky starts having some flashbacks, and I know that because it's like above his head, right? And so... Uh, he remembers the first two Rocky movies when he fought Apollo Creed and took a beating. He remembers Rocky III when he fought Clubber Lang, played by Mr. T. He remembers Rocky IV fighting Ivan Drago, the Russian. And then he hears his manager, who had died in an earlier film, Mickey, say to him, What are you doing? I didn't hear no bell. Get up. Get up. Because Mickey loves you. And then you hear the music. Dun, 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 Even if you've never seen Rocky movie, you know what's going to happen next. Rocky gets up. Hey, yo, Tommy, I didn't hear no bell. One more round. Let's go. And Rocky just annihilates Tommy, and he gets to punch the manager too, which is a lot of fun. But here's the thing, guys. You might be down, but you are not out. This is why Moses is telling the people, you can change your story. Like, it's not too late. I didn't hear no bell. Your story's not over, and you want to know who else it wasn't over for? Joseph. Joseph saved God's people from starvation. Moses led God's people out of slavery. Rahab helped Joshua and his crew take the promised land. Peter preached when the Holy Spirit came upon him and thousands were saved. And Jesus Christ rose again, conquered death. And the Bible says that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the grave lives in us. And so Jesus is saying to us, I didn't hear no bell. Like, get up. Because I'm not done with you and your family yet. And so accept the things you can't change, align yourself with God, activate a plan for your family, anticipate God at work. And so as we close, let me just ask this question. What is the new thing that God wants to do in your family? Or better yet, do you believe that God wants to do something new? What is the plan you need to activate? Because don't just hope for things to be different. Today, sit down with your family and let's just, just talk through it. Hey, what's the thing that we really need to do? How do we turn the tide in our family? How do we move closer to Jesus, lean into him, align ourselves with a God who's always at work, work through the past or leave it behind because your story isn't over? I didn't hear no bell. Down doesn't mean out because God always 
changes family stories when we turn to him.